Sorry about that. Glad to see everybody here. We have folks visiting. I am thrilled that you're here. If you're a guest here, we appreciate that. If you're family, we love you. And uh, we're just really glad that everybody is here together and in this place. Uh, we have been talking a little bit about the idea of the power of what Jesus Christ accomplished whenever he died. Uh, you will remember that we touched upon uh, Luke chapter 1 uh, as Zechariah was describing the kind of result or the end thereof that the, the, the salvation of Christ was going to bring. Uh, he said to rescue us from the hand of our enemies in 74 and to enable us to serve him without fear. In holiness and righteousness all of our days. There's something that's different about the cross. That's what I want you to try and grasp. There's more to the cross than there was to the previous covenant. The previous covenant left the person unable unable. The previous covenant was not a cure. The present covenant, the era of the cross, is God's design for the curing of man's soul. So it is not just a securing of a man's soul in heaven that we're talking about, but we are also describing the transition that can happen to a man's soul, the change that can happen to a man's life because of the power of the work of the grace of God and the cross of Jesus Christ and the message that is proclaimed about him involves this idea of sanctification. Sanctification is you being set apart. That's what it means. You are no longer distinguished with the world. God tells something different about you, how you live, how you think. And not only that, but his diagnosis of where you are and where you will be eternally. So there's a lot of things that are involved here. In the process of sanctification is separation of the believer from things that are evil to things that are pure, to things that are good, to things that are holy and righteous. That's what God uh, has done. There is this process called regeneration. Regeneration is the idea of new life that you find in the Scripture. Because of our sin, we were dead in our sins and transgressions, Ephesians chapter 2. But God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive. He gave us something new. Now, that new life is the sanctifying work of God. That's what's accomplished through the Spirit of God, 2 Peter chapter 1. But, but there's more to that idea. It is not just that God takes up his people and says, ha, ultimately I'm going to redeem them in the end. Meanwhile, they're horrible, they're terrible. They can't get their act together. It's not true. God is fortifying us, our lives, by His Spirit. And there are good things that are happening in this process. Okay, so I want to give you just a glance over some few verses. If you're taking notes, you can write these things down. Uh, salvation is deliverance. Okay, it's deliverance out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of, of, the, of the sun that God loves in this light idea. But there's more to the idea of sanctification. Sanctification is a process that God begins 
and that we are going to play a part in, and then we'll see that here in just a minute. Okay, so just for the sake of pinning down some few points, uh, let's begin with uh, idea number one out of Romans chapter one. Just look there momentarily. Romans chapter one and verse number seven. Romans chapter one and verse seven. It, this is the idea. The process of sanctification is originated by God. It cannot be done. It cannot be accomplished. It cannot be started by a man. And what I mean by that is, had God not done what Paul says here to him, uh, to all those in Rome who are loved by God, look, called to be saints. That's our word. Called to be sanctified, set apart, something that God has a purpose for other than going on their own course, doing things their own way, repeating the same thing that they have been doing. God calls. He is the originator of that, not man. That's what I'm trying to say. It is not of man to see that. We didn't even realize we needed that. But God, who is rich in mercy, made us who were dead alive in Christ. It's all about what God has done. God has put this work in your life into its course, into its action. And the only reason that you're tasting of the goodness of God is because His grace was poured out to you. Because there was no way that you could have initiated this kind of thing. God calls you. Listen to the language. He calls you to be saints. He doesn't call you to be, listen, same. He doesn't ask that you be the same. He asks that you be saints. There's a difference there. Saints has to do with this idea of the work of Jesus Christ in the cross, whereby because of that power, because of that incredible work of God, our lives can be transformed more and more into the image of Christ. We are called to be saints. Now, the word is that which sanctifies. All right, so if you're uh, going, go with me to John 17. John 17, I want you to look at this prayer uh, by our Lord, specifically for the disciples. Ultimately, he'll pray for everybody, but, but right here, he is praying for uh, his men. He says in verse 13 out of chapter 17, I'm coming to you now. I say these things while I'm still in the world so that they may have the full measure of my joy. I have given them your word. The world has hated them. They're not of the world. My prayer is that you not take them out of the world, but that you protect them. They are not of the world any more than I'm of it. Now, notice verse 17. Sickle it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. All right, there's two important principles that lie right here in this passage. Number one, these men are already saved. Jesus goes on to tell these men, all of you are clean except for Judas. All of you are clean. You're right with God. Yet, Jesus is praying over these men who are right with God. God, I want you to sanctify them. I want you to work in them. To do what? To set them apart even more for your purpose. Up to this point, these men had been in a growing phase. You could see their real lives. They had been living. They were similar, were they not? But there's some transition and you begin to see that even though Peter says things that he shouldn't say, he is beginning to piece the things together that he shouldn't have said what he said. 
And that's the power of God, the work of God, the calling to holiness, the ability to take your life and not make it the same, but make it of saints, of sanctification. But also, secondly, notice that the word is the means whereby these men are sanctified. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. All right, it's a, it's a very clear, simple procedure. God sanctifies. He sets people apart. It's amazing. It's wonderful. It's mind-boggling. But there is some avenue through which the truth of the Word of God is the agent of that sanctifying. And that throws all kinds of images in front. Because the, the, you know that the, the sword of spirit is the word of God. Remember from Ephesians chapter 6? So we have this idea that the, the, the spirit is connected to the word. Oh man, there's just some rich overtones there. But the point is, is that Jesus recognizes that these men are saved. They're already okay with God. This is not a questioning of their relationship with God. This is them naturally moving forward. That is where God is looking for us. That is the exact same process God sees fit for us. is for me to move forward, for me to become more. Not to be same, but to be more of what God calls me to be. Sanctify them by the truth. They are asking, Jesus is asking for a place for the Word of God to be found in their hearts and their lives to be dedicated to that. That's what he's asking. Sanctify them. You can work in them, God. You will continue by your Spirit through the Word. <laughs> it's just fabulous. You can work in this. All right, so uh, let's look further. Sanctification is only possible because of the death of Christ. Now, turn over to Hebrews chapter 10, and we'll see this even further fleshed out here. Hebrews chapter 10. So it's a, it's a process that's originated, okay, by God. You cannot do the starting stuff. God does that. He calls us. The Word of God is what sanctifies in some weird way. There's a connection there to the Spirit, the work of the Spirit, something going on. But to saved men, Jesus is praying that these men be sanctified. Well, what does that mean? Let's look further. In Hebrews chapter 10, uh, we will see uh, this passage is speaking about Christ. Uh, ver verse 8, first of all, sacrifices and offerings, burnt offerings, sin offerings, you did not desire, nor were you pleased with them, uh, although the law required them. Then he said, here am I, these are the words of Christ, if you will, here am I, I've come to do your will. He sets aside the first covenant to establish the present is a better term for us. And by that will, we have been made holy through the sacrifice and the body of Christ Jesus once for all. Here is the motivating factor for us relative to the idea of our own grasping of sanctification, the death of Christ. That's what's motivating you. That's what's motivating me. Okay, if you, if you want to wrap your mind around something that is holy and righteous and good and pure and undefiled and true love, then go to the cross. Go to the cross and see the work of God. See the preparatory work that God did in order to make the cross happen in those microscopic 
realities and those details. See the work that God did to make that happen just according to our need. Mm. See the treachery of sin. See the defeat of sin. See the triumph over death. The work of the cross is your motivation. It is what will pull me in. It's what will lead me out. If you want to get your mind focused more on things that are spiritual, if you will contemplate the cross, it will naturally bring those things out. It will produce that for you. Just a, just a moment ago, we were standing around this table. And you know that some of you may have been in another place, but the minute we started that, you came right back. You settled in. You got your mind, because this is, it's not just symbolic of some gold tray. This means something. It's not some dumb ritual. This is a representation of that which we hold absolutely sacred and dear and exciting and encouraged by. The death of Christ. That's our motivation. It is that agent that is able to sanctify us, to make us holy. Yet, there is a, a side from God. There is clearly a side from God. For example, turn over to, let's look at three passages very quickly. Colossians 1. Colossians 1. <clears throat> Uh, I, I lied. It's three. They keep moving stuff on me. Chapter three. Sorry, verse nine. Chapter three, verse nine. Don't lie to each other, Paul says, since you have, look, this is what you've done. You've taken off, you've made that decision to take off the old self with its practices, God helping you, of course. And you have put on the new self, God helping you, of course. But there is clearly the implication that you are involved in that process of faith and, and have put on the new self, watch, which is the new self is being renewed in the knowledge, in the image of its creator. This is what God is doing. Uh, Philippians, just back a chapter or so. Philippians chapter 1. A passage that we have looked at many times. Philippians 1 and uh, verse 6, Paul is praying. He thanked God for the partnership, being, six, uh, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion. God will. He will finish what he started. Back to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 3, 2 Corinthians 3, and then we'll move on. 2 Corinthians 3, at the very end of the chapter, Paul's talking about the glory of the new covenant, the, 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 the era of the cross, and what it has in comparison to the previous covenant, the law of Moses. And, and, and there is one that clearly outshines the other. Because... Uh, the law of Moses left people empty. It left them unable. There was, there was much of the same that followed the old covenant. But, but here, notice that it's not the same. Watch the transformation that happens. Uh, verse 16, whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we <coughs> who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory 
are being transformed into his likeness with ever increasing glory which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. Man, that is incredible. God says about my life, I am able. He is giving in such a way that sanctification is bringing more and more of the glory that is intended for me is being revealed in my life. God is at work. Nevertheless, 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 3, 1 Peter chapter 3, 1 Peter chapter 3, this is awesome, this is really good stuff, you should be really excited about this, because this is like, take your breath away, it's good, it's just dynamite, 1 Peter chapter 3. Not because I'm saying it. I don't care if you like the way I'm saying it or not. But this is good stuff. 1 Peter 3. Notice what what Peter says. Uh, Verse 13, he says, Hey, who's going to harm you if you're eager to do what's good? Even if you should suffer for what's doing what's right, you're blessed. Don't fear what they fear. Don't be frightened. But, watch. But in your heart, circle it. That's your word. See, the NIV has two words. It says set apart. That's your word. King James readers would raise their hand if I said, is the word sanctified there? Yes. But in your heart, sanctify, set apart. That's the idea. But in your hearts, set apart Christ as Lord. All right, now, there's a couple of things that we want to weight down right here. Number one, this indicates a human responsibility. There is clearly this work of regeneration where God is involved. Absolutely. His hand is like muddied the whole. There's no way that his presence has not been there. But there is also, on the other side, this idea of sanctification in experience, in the life of a believer, in the life of one who is under the power, rule, and sovereignty of the almighty hand of God, who is at work heavily in the life of that person through the influence of his word and the spirit. Think about it. How can we be same? How can we be the same? We can't. But in the power of God, then we are able to be something different. And here is a place where you find Christian people being told who are already saved, who are already involved in this sanctification process. Here is something that you are urged to do. In your hearts, set apart Christ as Lord. Set apart Christ in your heart as Lord. Now, I don't know about you, but just listening to that idea, even right now, still, though I want it, though I desire it, there is still part of me that is roadblocked from understanding it because of my lack of maturity. I really and truly do not grasp the breadth of what it means to set apart Christ as the Lord in my life. But, but, there is also a transition. Most of us, when we obey the gospel, we come to Jesus, we have honesty, we have sincerity, we have obedience, we have a willingness to submit, we turn away from our sins and we confess Jesus Christ and we're baptized according to the scriptures and we really don't fully grasp, right? We really don't fully grasp what it means that Christ is Lord 
in my life. And so there's a growing process. It's not just time and chance here. Peter doesn't say, just sit back, it's just going to take its course. (laughs) You know, give it enough time, sanctification will come. That's not what he said. He didn't say that at all. He said, you, step, sanctify Christ as Lord in your heart. Set him apart. Distinguish him. Let there be no other challenger to his reign in your space. That's what Peter is calling the people to do. Those who are sanctified, who have already made this decision, just like the ones he's writing to right here, all of us who have made this decision to be children of God, followers of Christ, disciples, we have already been set apart for God's purposes. But the scripture indicates step, step, sanctify Christ as Lord in your heart. Now, something further interesting here is that the verbiage really indicates this general idea. Sanctify Christ and keep on sanctifying Christ as Lord in your heart. So there is this ongoing, this idea where we have a human responsibility. Turn over just for a moment to John chapter 1. John chapter 1. John chapter 1. John's talking about Jesus Christ and coming into the world, and he was in the world. Verse 10, the world didn't recognize him. Verse 11, he came to his own. They did not receive him. But notice verse 12. Yet to all who received him. To those who believed in his name. Do you see the connection there? The information came to these people and some The information was just static. And they did not really receive it. He came to his own and they received him not. But there was also others who received that information and they accepted it. They embraced it. They believed. They allowed that information to permeate and make their life something that was honoring to God something that was honoring to God. There is some measure of human responsibility to pursue those things that pertain to the sanctification process that God starts and that He is looking for us to walk in as well. Last last place, Hebrews 10. Hebrews 10, we'll wrap up. (coughs) 
Now you have to understand sort of what's going on here. These believers were on the verge of retreat to Judaism. This is a, a place that is extremely tense. The writer is very concerned. Half a dozen times in the book of Hebrews, he is urging them, don't, don't do this. Don't go back. Don't retreat. Don't let, don't let go. You can. God will help you. Be encouraged. Think about this. The cross did this. Don't retreat. Now in chapter 10, he says in verse 26, if we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sins is left, but only fearful expectation and judgment and raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. Anyone who died or rejected the law of Moses died without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much more severely do you think a man deserves to be punished who has trampled the Son of God underfoot? Look. Who has treated as an unholy thing the blood of the covenant that sanctified him and who has insulted the Spirit of grace. There are better things for us than that picture. And praise God that there are. Sanctification is God's intention. Okay? This is, I mean, it's crazy. God intends for my life and your life to be lived in holiness in righteousness and goodness and faithfulness and kindness and sincerity but I'm not that I am not that. Of course you're not. You're a sinner. But sinners who are in Christ, thank God, don't have to stay the same. There is a power that is at work. The power of God is at work in our lives, sanctifying. There's something going on in our lives where God, for the believer, is setting people apart from evil to the things that are good. That's what God wants. That's what He wants. And He's called us. He's called us to live in agreement, to desire in this life those things that God is doing, even that we may not be able to always perceive or tell. What is my disposition? What is your disposition? See, if, if we want... If we want the things that belong to God, then really and truly we want to become more holy and more righteous and more godly and more giving and more obedient and more submissive. At what point does God not want us to be those things? Hmm. God wants that. And thank God that the power of the cross makes it so that you don't have to be same. Same as you were 20 years ago. Same as you were five years ago. Same as you always are going to be as long as you believe 
that you will be. But the power of God and the word of God says, hey, your life, bad as it may be, horrid as it may be, foul, cruel, dark, ruled by sin as it may be, your life, praise God, can be transformed. Now that is good news. That's good news. But in your heart, sanctify Christ as Lord. That's a mountain for me. But I'm on it, climbing. Hope you're climbing too. We'll climb together. With God's help, we will become more and more of what God wants us to be. This morning, if you are not sanctified, then you are outside of Christ Jesus and outside of the grace of God. You need to remedy that this morning. If you're here and you're ready, subject to respond to the gospel invitation, that is right now. If in some way you're alive, you're looking and, and you're saying, you know what, I just want to be totally and completely in, in, in line with what Peter is calling. We'll pray with you and for you. You let us know how, you, how we can help you as together we stand and sing this song.